Duchy of Bourgogne in the year 1142, the largest church in Christendom stood on a hill above the tidy village of Cluny. That church with its towering belfry, Corinthian columns, and massive rectangular pilasters defined the pulse of the Benedictine Abbey of Cluny a large walled complex itself the center of a vast monastic empire, counting 10,000 monks and nuns in foundations spread across the continent from the Mediterranean to the British Isles. The sharply pointed Cluny Belfry was visible for miles around and had served across the last phase of a long journey as the locating focal point for a small band of horsemen that approached now, making its way up the final slope toward the monastery gate. The palfrey, on which a heavily cloaked rider sat, as it slowly ascended the hill, was a lighter weight horse and its unsteady gait suggested what a distance it had come. Trailing behind were four other ridden horses and a hitched pair pulling a covered cart. The wind was howling from the valley spread below and the sun was low on the distant ridge. The stout wooden gate banged open. The porter rushed out, going to the first horse to take its headstall and stirrup. In a bustle of activity, others of the minor orders followed from within the monastic enclosure, the almoner, oblates, and lay brothers. A knot of black robes, they surrounded the riders and the cart. With the porter's help, the first rider dismounted, throwing aside the covering woolen mantle and being seen only then for the religious woman she was. The porter bowed, showing his tonsure, muttering, my lady. Two others in the party were religious sisters, clothed like the first in a long gray belted tunic, scapular white coif and veil. Except that the fabric was the gray of rough undyed wool the garb was the habit of the Benedictine order. They were nuns. The party's six accompanying men were the horse master, the marshal, two armed henchmen, and two stewards. As the first nun, walking erect and at an authoritative clip, led the way through the gate, the receiving monks bowed, even while stealing glances at her sharply concentrated face. With whispers they had spoken of this arrival, although this woman of slight stature and medium height did not match the measure of the songs sung in her name. She was the Abbess Eloise, mother superior of the Abbey of the Paraclete, a ranking convent several days journey by river and rough trail to the north. In those whispers, they had spoken of what she would be coming for. There would be further songs. The porter had been instructed to show her at once into the main cloister garden, to which women were ordinarily forbidden entrance. But the instruction had come from the abbot primate himself. At this time of year, 
The garden was still bare of fruit and berries, but twigs shone with the fresh scales of buds and shoots. The waters of the central fountain drawing on the stream that ran below the monastic kitchens and toilet block had quickened in recent weeks, but would not splash again until the coming spring rains <coughs> replenished its flow. The normally bright marble of the arches and pillars of the surrounding arcade was dusky gray now, for the shadows of evening had settled on the place, like loneliness. The Vesper's bell would be ringing soon. The porter gestured at a garden bench, but did not wait to see if Mother Eloise would sit. She watched him hurry away, as relieved to be alone as, after the day's ride, she was to be standing. It was not long before the abbot primate entered, coming from the chapel. Because his cowl was up, his face was shadowed. Across his chest was the leather strap of a pilgrim's satchel hanging at his side. The unfettered stride with which he crossed to her suggested the depth of feeling that she knew was there. His arms were stretched toward her, but as he drew close, she genuflected a proper obeisance. With her head bowed, she reached for his hand, pulled it to her mouth, and kissed his ring. Grasping her upper arms, he lifted her. He lowered his cowl, unveiling sadness. Where is he, most holy father? she asked. The abbot primate turned slightly, gesture enough to indicate the chapter house. The darkened room close at hand, separated from the garden by a large arcaded gate of three stout arches, each one upheld by a clutch of fluted pillars. Mother Eloise peered into the room. Under the interlacing of groined ceiling vaults, the open space was large enough to accommodate the professed members of the monastic family, with each monk sitting at the wall on the stone bench that defined three sides of the rectangle. Now the room was vacant, but as her eyes adjusted, she made out the dark form of the catafalque standing in the center. She should have sought the abbot primate's leave to move away from him, but did not. Instead, she simply walked out of the garden, crossing through the arcade to enter the chapter house, going directly to the one for whom she had come. The lids of his eyes were down, but his lips were slightly parted. The lips from which the most precious words had pierced her heart, the lips with which her own had been so sweetly caressed. His lips, she bent to them, touched them light with, lightly with her cheek, and then put her mouth on his. Oh, Peter. The abbot primate took up a place behind her. To her back, he said quietly, When I sent for you, I assumed he would still be alive at your arrival. I am sorry. He waited. When finally she turned to him, she said, They condemned him because of me. Her voice was shot through with feeling, a mix of grief and anger. Because I refused to renounce my love, because he remained mine through all calamity. I will publish his virtues across all the world to punish the age that has not valued him. It is true, mother. They hated him for what he had in you. But he opposed them in their vain repudiations of God's mercy. By the end, he was an exemplar of mercy 
That is what he had from you. Mercy. Against all charges leveled at you, the measure of your love was mercy, not licentiousness. He disowned our promiscuity, she said. I did not. He did what was necessary to keep his authority, the abbot replied. As you yourself wanted, you flogged him with your writing to re-enter the fray, and he did. <clears throat> she said, Peter Abelard was an apostle of Caritas, and yet he was damned. The abbot said, the excommunication will be lifted. I will make it happen. Then the gates of heaven will be open to him. We will be authorized to inter him here in sacred ground, and we will do that here at Cluny. No, I will have him at the paraclete. I will have him with me. It's why I've come. Any ground that receives this man will be sacred. The abbot primate began to object, but she raised her hand again, stopping him. He stared at her. She did not blink. Finally, he lowered his eyes. One of the most powerful men in Christendom, yet he yielded to this woman. I will depart with him tomorrow at first light, she said. I will need fresh horses. He will be mine at last. After a long silence, the abbot pulled back the flap of his leather satchel, and he withdrew a sheaf of the ribboned vellum sheets. He said, Peter asked me to return these to you. Mother Eloise received the bundle solemnly, knowing at once what it was. Her letters. All that she had written to him. <coughs> and then the abbot produced another pair of bundles. He said, these also, his credo, a last explanation of himself, solemnly the abbot handed her the sheaf, and the other, he held the second, hesitating, an unfinished treatise, what he called Dialogue with the Jew. I alone have read it. Guard these words. Peter was never guarded with words, she said. She received the pages, but she was bristling. Guard these words, mother. Clairvaux's dark angels are everywhere, spies, even here at Cluny. He joined with me in the petition to Rome only because he, Clairvaux, the enemy, thinks he has heard the last from Peter Abelard. This treatise must not be published. They condemned him once because of the Jews. They will again. Jews are being attacked, murdered, she said. If Peter wrote of Jews now, despite the council's damnimus, it was to defend our Lord's own cousins, for was Jesus Christ not a Jew? Mother, there are reports of Jews slaughtering Christian children to get their blood. That is nonsense. Perhaps, but Jews murdered their own children in Mainz. That is certain. Yes, she said, to prevent their being kidnapped by the crossbearers and forcibly baptized. That was not murder, it was martyrdom. Be careful of that, mother. These are fires from which we must now protect Peter Abelard's name. Jews be damned. The battle now is for Peter's eternal salvation. We must have the anathema voided. Guard those words if you want the papal rescript granted. Father Abbott took hold of her forearm fiercely. For the sake of his eternal soul, mother, guard those words. She clung to the pages. Despite the hot rush of what she felt, she nodded. 
a promise. Nineteen fifty, New York, Chapter One. Father Michael Kavanaugh wandered the park for most of an hour and was in the thickly wooded well of the Glen when it began to rain. He wasn't sure which way was out. The path ahead ascended steeply, and he took it, cursing himself for not having worn a hat. At first the rain was light, but it began to come down sharply, and he picked up the pace, moving steadily uphill. Because the path was serpentine, the foliage overgrown and the downpour heavy, he could not see ahead, and it surprised him when, as he was taking a last turn, the huge museum building appeared above, looming like a granite butte. He headed for it. An American Catholic should have loved that place. The museum took the form of a medieval monastery with elements plucked from the rubble of a long lost Europe and lovingly restored on a pinnacle overlooking the Hudson River. But at that point, few Catholics did. The cloisters housed the Metropolitan Art Museum's masterpiece collections of tapestries, altarpieces, frescoes, sculpted figures, fountains, and stained glass windows, all dating to between the 12th and 15th centuries. But the cloisters was not a true monastery or even an authentic imitation. It was a Rockefeller-funded fantasy structure, a mishmash of belfries, architectural fragments, aged pillars, arched doorways, stairways, arcades, all tastefully reassembled to invoke the high romance of Gothic revival that had so quickened the patrician imagination of the Gilded Age. The inspiration here was not St. Henry, St. Henry, the patron hallow of the childless and the handicapped, but Henry Adams, for whom Chartres' triumph was only aesthetic. In fact, the museum was a stunning monument to the artistic achievement of Catholic high culture. But Kavanaugh's parishioners knew better than to consider it theirs. What were a bunch of moth-eaten old wall hangings or limestone statues with smashed faces, anyway? What counted in monasteries were the monks and nuns and their spiritual works of mercy, men and women on their knees, not gawking at pictures. To the good people of Good Shepherd, the cloister seemed a peculiar, haunted emptiness. And but for the handful of Irish who found employment there as guards or maintenance men, the parish was content to ignore it. Kavanaugh rushed into the place for its shelter from the rain. A short walk down a stone corridor hung with a gruesome crucifix of penitent Magdalene and a sorrowful Madonna, led into a large rectangular enclosure and organized around a glassed-in courtyard, a classic rendition of the ancient monastic hub. The quadrangle was defined by a long, four-sided arcade that begged to be walked around. At the far opposite end of the colonnade, a small group of people were gathered around a painting too far away to notice or care about the complications of a momentarily thrown middle-aged priest. To his right, through a semicircular arch whose Romanesque sturdiness jarred with the more delicately pointed Gothic era arches of the arcade proper, was a vacant, unfurnished, low ceiling hall with a stone bench running all along three walls. He went in, as if the room had been his destination all along, and he took up a place on the bench as if he had a right to be there. He picked up his breviary and reflexively flipped the ribbon to the appointed page. He began to read the day's psalm as if he were a monk. Cloister, he heard some moments later, from the Latin claustrum for closed, 
a voice had come to Kavanaugh, but it was some woman's. He did not look up. In French, she continued, we say cloître. In this museum, we have five distinct cloisters, hence the plural of the museum's name, the cloisters. But this one, dating to the 12th century, is the jewel, the one around which all the others are organized, the reason we are here. When Kavanaugh raised his eyes, it was to find that instead of along the arcade or at the closed-in quad, the woman was looking directly at him. She was a museum docent, clearly. She was giving instruction to a clutch of ladies whose look was fixed the other way down the aisle of the colonnade along which the docent had been pointing. She had spoken enough so that Kavanaugh took in her French accent. There was an aphonic quality to her voice, low-pitched, rough, suggesting a whisper, though she could be readily heard. When their eyes met, they held each other's gaze for a long moment. Then she faced away and resumed. When this cloister was in its monastery, La Chapelle sur Loire, in southern Bourgogne, its dimensions were twice this size. The ladies earnestly looked about, taking in the quadrangles, pink marble arches, and supporting columns. Constructed most of a thousand years ago, the docent took several steps away from the group, letting her long, thin arm carve a graceful arc, encompassing the entire scene, an unfeigned gesture of delight. This was the enclosure onto which all of the monastic buildings would have opened, the chapel, refectory, dormitories, kitchen, and chapter house. At this last phrase, she threw a sidelong glance at Kavanaugh's way, which made him realize the chapter house referred to the room he had settled in. The docent turned, taking a few steps along the arcade. The ladies followed. This cloister, she continued, carefully pronouncing each word, but with her Gallic intonation, formed the center of one of the network of Benedictine foundations attached to the great abbey at Cluny. Her spiel was practiced, but did not seem canned. She simply knew what she was talking about. She had fallen into an unselfconscious pose letting her fingers rest in a stone <coughs> crevice, joining a pillar to its sculpted capital, her hand at a level just above her head. She was tall. She was dressed unremarkably in black laced Oxford shoes, a long, dark skirt, and a white blouse whose pointed collars were slightly askew above a formless, fully buttoned cardigan sweater. She wore no jewelry. The slender hand at her hollow cheek emphasized an overall litheness. Her black hair was cut short like a man's, close against her skull. Her clothing hung on her loosely. She was not lithe, she saw now, but extremely thin, as if her body had known malnourishment. A wasting disease in her past, perhaps consumption and tuberculosis. The only skin showing was at her hands and face, but it carried the hint of an ashen hue. If you please, the woman said, moving the group along, this carving of a double-headed monster, they began to drift away toward a new threshold, which invites the viewer to contemplate as the monks always would have. Her last words carried back to Kavanaugh. The great struggle between vice and virtue. Then they were gone. Well, you get the picture. <laughs> How many people have been to the cloisters? 
I'll tell you another place. That central garden is where Eloise collected Peter Abelard. So the, now the cloister says, but why not? It actually could be, which is the point of fiction. What if, as our friend Anne Bernays, a Pamela Painter, true, they asked the book they wrote about fiction. I want to thank Galen and Tricia for your welcome. I know it is what an honor it is to be in the tradition of reading here. I want to thank you all for coming this evening. We have a few minutes. I'd be glad to carry our conversation with you. Is there anything you'd like to say? Yes. I'm wondering what got you interested in Eloise and Avalon. What got me interested in Eloise and Abelard? Well, as a young man, I knew their story, but only as a passionate love story that went awry. You remember that, so Peter Abelard was, died uh, in the early 1140s, perhaps 1142 or 1143. You all remember uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine, uh, who you most dramatically encountered when Catherine Hepburn played her in The Lion in Winter as an old woman up against an aged King Henry, I mean, King Richard the Lionhearted, uh, played by Peter O'Toole. But as a young woman, Eleanor of Aquitaine invented the myths associated with courtly love. So she was the the queen, uh, first of France, then uh, she was the, kind of the heir, the princess of Aquitaine, became the queen of France and the queen of England in the period of the Second Crusade, went with her husband uh, Louis on the crusade to the Holy Land. Uh, but she was the one who commissioned troubadours to sing the great songs of romance. And one of the myths of courtly love, you recall, was uh, unrequited and chaste love. Prince Lancelot and his chaste love for Guinevere. This was the time when uh, the knights were secretly dedicating their tournament to the, uh, the woman who was not available to them, and so on. Well, Eleanor was uh, enthralled with the story of Abelard and Eloise. And she was the one who saw to the broad publication of their letters, uh, which made the myth of the passionate romance that was thwarted by the church. Because as you remember the story, Peter Abelard, the greatest teacher in Europe at the cathedral school in Paris at Notre Dame, what becomes the University of Paris, the Sorbonne today, Peter Abelard was the inventor of the university in Paris, and he was given the uh, instruction by the canon of the cathedral, the man in charge, to instruct his niece, who had outpaced the, the instructor nuns in the convent where she had been raised. She was a member of the royal family. And they fell in love, and they had a passionate affair. And when the canon of the cathedral discovered it, he sent his henchmen to attack Peter Abelard, who was castrated, humiliated, shamed, expelled, and uh, effectively banished to a monastery. And Eloise self-banished herself in response to a monastery, became a nun, and yet, and yet that became that began the most powerful part of their relationship because even though they were separated, even though they had a child, that was what led to their being discovered. The child was raised by Peter's sister. They exchanged letters over the next 20 years that are a record of passionate love, recrimination, guilt. He's guilty. She is insistent on the beauty and power of their love for each other, including its physical aspects, doesn't regret anything. She's in a way the first feminist. She's, she claims her integrity 
She claims her power as a woman. She refuses to yield to this um, self-hating, self-doubting, um, self-recrimination. And on the contrary, <coughs> she challenges him to re-enter the fray that he had left. And he begins to join the debate of the great theological crisis that was unfolding just then in the time of the Crusades, because that's when sacred violence came into the Christian imagination. God wills it, was the slogan of the First Crusade. God was understood as wanting Christians to slay the infidel, including the infidel near at hand, the Jews. Peter Abelard comes to the defense of a different kind of God, rejects this new violent God, and in particular defends the right of Jews to live peacefully as Jews within Christendom, and for that he was condemned as a heretic. When I was a young man, I knew the romance, but I didn't know the powerful witness against the Jew hatred of the Christian tradition. And over the last few decades, I have taken on, for peculiar reasons of my own, the question of Christian anti-Semitism. And when I discovered that Peter Abelard and Eloise were at the threshold of this decisive choice that the Christian world made against the Jews, I understood that the story could have gone another way if Peter Abelard's view had carried the day. And when I encountered, I first wrote about that in a book about anti-Semitism uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I'm a novelist. I knew, even as I was working on the history, that someday I would return to the subject as a novelist. So Peter Abelard and Eloise, I do tell that story here, climaxing with his condemnation of the Council of Sin, and that prologue that I just read, coming shortly after that, Peter has died, refers to his having been condemned. Um, they're great great figures, and if they had carried the day, as I said, we would live in a different world now. It would be a very different world. Which is why we study history, isn't it? Because if we understand that calamitous events in the past might have gone another way, we can understand that they can go a different way yet. That's the point. And Michael Cavanaugh, a young priest in Good Shepherd Parish who knows nothing about the <coughs> real reason for Abelard's notoriety is instructed in that story by the woman whom we've just encountered, the docent at the Cloisters, who was a French woman, this is 1950, who has recently arrived in New York, having been interned with her father in Drancy the concentration camp on the outskirts of Paris. She's a Jew. Her father, a great Talmudic scholar, saw the debt. Determined in 1940 and 41, as the news of Vichy is coming down on Jews in France, determined that France needed to know the other story about this great hero of French culture, Peter Abelard, who was remembered as Eleanor of Aquitaine's beau ideal of romantic love. But what about Peter Abelard, the defender of the Jewish people? So Rachel's father takes on the task of bringing that Abelard forward. And of course, it gets him killed. Now you don't need, need to read the novel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, ma'am. Uh memory is wonderful, but it's a little short. So uh, I did read the book, and uh, and, and loved it. But Bernard, do you know, Clevo, now is that the Saint Bernard? That's the Saint Bernard. That, that is Bernard. the Saint yes. Bernard. Does yes. not come off well in the. In the no, he's a villain, isn't he? Yes, he really is. Yes, and, and he's a saint. Yeah. yeah. Guess what? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Guess what? Yeah. And who was he? There was another one. To, um, that's what I'm forgetting. Well, Peter the Venerable. Yes. Is the abbot the, pri the abbot primate of Cluny? Is that the one you're thinking? I think, I think so, but I, I just wondered. Um... People who love Saint Bernard 
And we're not talking about the dog. <laughs> Although the dog is named for this saint. People who love St. Bernard will not like my novel. Because I put it entirely different. St. Bernard was the preacher of the crusade. He was the founder of the Knights Templar, which is a religious order under the laws of poverty, chastity, and obedience, but they're the Marine Corps of the Middle Ages. They will go anywhere and kill anybody, as long as they're an infidel. And that's St. Bernard. St. Bernard is part of El Eleanor of Aquitaine's romantic love glorification of knighthood. And, and the, the fact that the knight gets dubbed with the sword at the altar in a religious ceremony, there's something whacked about this. <laughs> God wills it. What happened to the Prince of Peace? That's Peter Abelard's question. Bernard is a saint. He, had the he was the most powerful man in Christendom at that moment. He had the Pope under his thumb. And he's the one who saw to the condemnation of Peter Abelard. So, so that was my question, just that your portrayal of him in the novel is historically very accurate. It's arguable. <laughs> you know, history, history is always an argument. It's an interpretation. <coughs> uh, there were things about St. Bernard that made him get, or made a saint. I mean, he was, there were virtues, but, and every person has, is a mixed bag. Um, but St. Bernard, the fact that St. Bernard won the contest with Peter Abelard is one of the great tragedies, not of Christian history, but of Western history. Because it sacralized violence in the Christian imagination. The just war. God wants us to kill people. And you know, it, it, we're only getting out of it now. And we're not getting out of it. We're not getting out of it. No, no, we're, some of us are getting out of it now. I mean, there, you know, there's a great Christian pushback against this. Did, did I? Yes, Do you I, want to come back? Uh, maybe you're a fan of St. Bernard. Like no, no, I'm not. I'm not particularly, but I was just surprised. I was just surprised. That was a surprise to me when I read it. The other question I have is, just, you know, it's completely different. Will there be a second Bernard? Will there be a second Bernard? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it's very painful for him. But it's ultimately so redemptive. It changes him. And he changes his life because of it. And it's not a romance. This actually, this is, it's not a romance. Which is, you know, a disappointment to some. <laughs> that isn't the point. It's, 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 it's an encounter over the truth. And it's 1950, and, uh, you know, Christians, Catholics in particular, had not at all begun to reckon with what had just happened in Europe. Catholics and Christians, in, the, in France certainly, but even including in Germany, were embracing the myth that the church had been as much a victim of the Nazi uh, demonizing of the world uh, as Jews were. And there was no reckoning, not for years. And it's still not finished. It's not finished at all. And France is still having trouble reckoning with its complicity in what happened in France. The, you know, the people who arrested the Jews in Paris were not Germans. The guards in France were not Germans. There's an encounter between Rachel and a young French policeman in the first holding pen where the Jews have been taken, a grotesque situation, and this young, naive French policeman says to her, why are they doing this to you? And she looks around and she said, you mean the Germans? I don't see any Germans here. Yeah. comments or questions? Yes, ma'am. What is the title of the book you wrote 20 years ago, the nonfiction book about anti-Semitism? It's called Constantine's Sword, The Church and the Jews, a History, and it would hold the door open. It's a plow. <laughs> but it was a plow to write. But one of the pivot points, there are a number of pivot points. There are great moments in this history where the story could have gone another way. And Abelard is one of them. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you. Could you comment on Pope Francis and where you see the current moment in this continuum? Well, I think of Pope Francis as another one of those pivot points. Uh, it's a great gift to the Catholic Church, I also think to the West at this moment, to have this man in a position of leadership who's so clear about the moral crisis facing us, especially the vast inequality that is defining the problems, not just of the United States and the West and Europe, but of the globe. And if there's one thing Francis stands for, it is decrying the inequality of the world. And of course, the immediate emblem of that are the migrants who wash up on the shores of Europe. And he is their stoutest defender. He issued a decree 18 months ago to every Catholic parish in Europe, ordering them to take in a migrant family and provide housing and support for a migrant family. It was disobeyed. Imagine if Pope Pius XII had ordered every Catholic parish in Europe to take in a Jewish family in 1940. Um, having said that, I've written a lot about Pope Francis for the NewYorker.com, and I'm publishing a piece there tonight or tomorrow about his recent uh, advancing toward the cause of saint sainthood the cardinal primate of Poland during World War II, August Holland, who was being raised to sainthood in the Catholic Church. He is remembered in Poland as a stout opponent of the Nazis and then after the war of the Soviets. He died in 1948. He was a ferocious anti-Semite. He defended Jews against the violent attacks, but in his same pronouncements about not attacking Jews, 
he promulgated the same old anti-Jewish slanders, calumnies, the Christ killers, the people who have turned against God, therefore God has turned against them. Christian theology of St. Bernard, the theology that took hold of the Christian imagination a thousand years ago, uh, he has been promulgating that. So I take Pope Francis to task. Um, he's going to totally freak out when he reads this. <laughs> I'm sure. Because it shows you what we're, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about human institutions and human beings. And even though Pope Francis made a huge advance of Jewish-Christian relations a year ago, when he said formally and officially the first time, the Catholic Church renounces its ambition to convert the Jews. Converting the Jews has been job one of the Catholic Church <laughs> for 2,000 years. And, it's, and the impulse to convert the Jews has been at the bottom of all of this problem and hatred because it drives Catholics and Christians crazy that Jews, Jesus was a Jew, but the whole point of the story of Jesus is based on a thousand years of Jewish expectation and belief about the Messiah. And Jesus fulfills all those expectations and belief, but the Jews say no to it? If Buddhists say no to it, no offense, Larry, if Buddhists <laughs> say no to it, no problem. If atheists say no to it, no problem. If Jews say no to it, holy cow, maybe it's not true. We can't stand that possibility. That's what generates our insecurity slash hatred of the Jews. Pope Francis renounced the Christian agenda of converting the Jews. The Jews don't need to be converted. The Jews don't need Jesus to be in touch with God. Wow. <laughs> So Pope Francis is presiding over the largest changes um, in this theology in a thousand years. <clears throat> and, and he's doing it unevenly. So he has a blind spot about the Cardinal Primate of Poland. After tomorrow, he won't have it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. gentleman is referring to the 2018 law, so February of this year, passed by the Law and Justice Party government in Poland. The Law and Justice Party is an extreme nationalist, right-wing uh, government in Poland that made it illegal to suggest that Poles or Poland were co-responsible or complicit in the Holocaust. Now, the background for this, of course, is that there's a broad misunderstanding of the complexity of the experience that the Polish nation underwent during World War II. Remember that three million Polish Jews were murdered. Six, of the six million Jews murdered, three million of them were in Poland. But there were three million or so Polish Catholics murdered by the Nazis, too. So the Poles think of themselves as a victim people. And they push back against the idea that the Jews are the victims, especially when the complicity of many Poles is brought up. And when people talk about Auschwitz as the Polish concentration camp, they go completely nuts. Mm. So it's not, you're not allowed to say, it's against the law in Poland to call Auschwitz a Polish concentration camp. It isn't a Polish concentration camp. It never was. It was a German Nazi concentration camp in Poland. So that's the background to this law. But the law is a Holocaust distorting terrible law that needs to be criticized, which is why this is not the time to move towards sainthood a, a cardinal primate of Poland who was himself complicit in the Holocaust, even though he opposed the Nazis. How was he complicit? By advancing the theology that made what the Nazis do, did possible. That's the complicity. It's not just the Polish Catholics, it's the 
Catholic world, the Christian world in general. How it's not just, you know, there were many thousands of perpetrators, but millions of people who were indifferent to what happened. And how, where did that indifference come from? Where did the perpetrator come from? It came from a thousand, eighteen hundred years worth of demeaning, defaming, telling lies about the Jewish people. Anti-Semitism is on the rise again in Poland, yeah. and it's no surprise. Yeah. The comeback of fascism, and this is one of the things that Pope Francis has been most explicit about. Uh, you know, he has compared the present moment in Europe to the early 1930s. It's important not to get hysterical about that, and not to, and not to uh, somehow water down the historic character of the Nazi crime by comparing it readily to other moments. So we're not, we don't have Hitler in front of us, but nevertheless, it's important to remember. And uh, the most important thing for people like me to remember is that uh, we Christians are and uh, are, we're complicit and co-responsible for the Holocaust, and we have not in any way fully reckoned with that. And until we do reckon with it, and therefore change the theology that generated that complicity, we're still a danger to the Jews and to others. And the, uh, the anti-Islamic, the ease with which we uh, embraced a war against Islam is tied to this dynamic in our imaginations. Yes, yes sir. I have a question about church politics. As I understand it, folks are selected by cardinals. Yes. I understood the history of recent history the other very conservative folks in the pack deck. Uh, so how do how Francis got through this whole thing? My question is whether or not Francis is similarly trying to change the deck. So the question is about church <clears throat> politics. It's a good question. I'm no expert on it, but I'll tell you my impression. Pa Francis at this point has appointed about 50 cardinals. And once you turn 80, you're not allowed to vote in the next election. So the cardinals, the very conservative cardinals who were appointed by Pope Benedict and Pope John Paul are aging out. Uh, it's, still, it's still hard to predict what would happen. Why did, uh, why did the cardinals choose this maverick figure, Francis? Well, the real radical choice wasn't theirs. It was the choice of Pope Benedict to resign. Popes don't resign. You know, the press suggested, oh, some pope had resigned in the Middle Ages. No, popes don't resign. The popes who didn't finish out their terms in the Middle Ages were driven out of town, you know, in, in the tribal warfare of various uh, clan families. Popes do not resign. When a pope resigned, it, that was the revolutionary moment. And so when the cardinals gathered in Sistine Chapel with Benedict having resigned, they're looking at each other and going like, <laughs> what is this? They knew they had to do something. They could not just pick up one of the other guys in that mold. And uh, Francis was already known as the Bishop of the Poor. And, of course, why did Benedict resign? He resigned because what the Holocaust had not done alas, which has caused a major moral crisis in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has been deflecting it. What the Holocaust had not done, the pre-sex abuse scandal did big time. And now we know, of course, that some of the cardinals themselves were abusers. Cardinal Pell, reliably accused now, and under about to go under a civil trial in Australia. Cardinal Pell, who was Pope Francis's man in charge of finances. So, so the collapse of moral authority of the Catholic Church, which is blatant and obvious to everybody, even to the cardinals, required a change. What happens next? Who knows? Uh, we have time for maybe one more, and then I'll be glad to chat informally afterwards if anybody has the impulse. Yes, ma'am. Your um, way of approaching your writing. 
how, how I approach my writing. I mean, how, how much time do you devote to it? Yeah. Do you have a certain time to say, you know, certain place? Those kinds of things. Thank you for that. It's a good question. You know, we, we all, I'm always anxious to know what, how writers live their work and life concretely. Yeah. I'm privileged to live with my life partner, my wife, Lexa Marshall, who's also a writer, and we have a little cottage industry in our house. <laughs> uh, a little too little, wouldn't you say? Uh, so Lexa goes to her room and I go to my room. We've been fellow writers in the house for more than 40 years. It's a simple life, especially now that our children are gone. Uh, <coughs> although our daughter's back with her children. And you know why you... Um, don't kill your children <laughs> so that you can get your grandchildren. <laughs> But no, I just I just go to my desk and uh, hope something happens. Do you, have, do you have a special time of day? Do you, know, you work from one one time to another? Uh, through the day, more or less. I wouldn't call it work. You know, uh, I mean, it's work. It's horrible, but it's you know, a good day is when you forgot what time it is and yes. you look up and the day is going by. Yeah. But then you immediately panic. Geez, another one. Anyway, it, yes, uh, Tricia. Can I just quickly ask, what are you working on now? What am I working on now? Well, <clears throat> I spent the last several weeks getting ready for this evening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and tomorrow I'll work on getting to uh, the beach before the line. It gets too long. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not really working on anything. Else. I. I just am so grateful to you all for coming out tonight. I, uh, like Lexa, spend most of my life imagining readers. <laughs> and their publishing a book is a great privilege because you bring your secret life uh, into the public, and if you're lucky, some. People will find a way to be kind to you. Uh, not always the case, but you are you are very precious to me, more than you could imagine. To be able to be in the presence of readers, and to be in the presence of readers in a library, which is one of the great surviving institutions of our culture. Yes. Imagine if we didn't have libraries. Would the Republicans vote? to establish libraries. <laughs> 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 I just want to 